Hi guys. I'm here today to talk a little bit about the lunar nodes, which of course is a you know widely discussed topic in astrology today. And there's of course a lot of differing opinions about them and controversies. Um, I currently have a couple videos on my YouTube channel uh, where I talk with a friend with two different friends about the nodes, and I'm hoping to make more videos in that vein. But this video is more about um, electional astrology, and I'm going to talk a little bit about talisman creation um, with regard to the nodes, as as well as the nature of magic and the nature of karma and um, religious doctrine as well. It kind of all gets tied up into this this subject uh, as I've been discussing it. Um, yeah, recently I've just been discussing this with a few people on Facebook and stuff, and you know, uh, they weren't really too amenable to what I had to say. And to be fair, Facebook is a difficult forum for communication many of the time because, or much of the time, because, you know, a lot of our, a lot of our intentions and stuff get lost in the words and get lost in the, um, the fact that we're not face to face. So oftentimes, um, things come out sounding a bit black and white. And I realized this about some of the things I was saying uh, online on Facebook about the nodes. And so I kind of just decided, yeah, I'll just make this video and hopefully it'll sort of clarify what I'm saying. Because the one, the one major thing that people need to realize is we need to get away from the artificial dichotomy of the nodes. And that is that both applies to this notion that the north node is always good and the south node is always bad the older the older notion that both nodes are just totally malefic and evil and bad in in any circumstances um which isn't totally the ancient uh conceptualization i'm simplifying things here but the point is is both both of these are really dualistic uh, approaches you know to say that both nodes are just totally evil nothing good comes of them to say that one node is very very good and one node is very very bad or as the more modern astrologers like to say where they take the north node to signify something about your destiny and what you need to be doing in this life for some kind of evolution and that the south node is past lives and um, gets in the way of evolution uh, i've already talked with uh, my friend Fernando in one of my videos about how the soul doesn't evolve. So I probably won't get too much into that here, but um, all of these, all of these conceptions are too one dimensional. And so we really need to understand better, like what the nodes are and what they do and how they work. And I don't hope to capture that in this one single video, but I hope to get into some areas that I haven't uh, explored as much uh, publicly and openly and hopefully it'll be interesting for you guys. Okay, so the first thing that's interesting is that um, the further back you go in the astrological tradition, like if you go into Hellenistic astrology and you go into um, a lot of the Indian astrological texts, right, the nodes are pretty malefic by and large, both of them. And actually in some cases, the North Node is even worse than the South Node. And actually in India, this is often the case with, Indian astrological opinion that the North Node tends to wreak havoc like mm. crazy compared to the South Node. Excuse me, I'm just going to silence that. And um, and so that's that's very that's very different from what we're often taught when we get into modern astrology. And of course, then certain like Arabic astrologers and then astrologers in the Middle Ages and through the Renaissance started to for whatever reason, adopt this idea that the North Node was like warm, benefic, and increasing in its nature and just really good, and that the South Node was really malefic and decreasing and destructive only, kind of, you know, it became more uh, one-dimensional, I suppose. And I really don't know why this is. It's quite funny because in several Indian texts like Brihat Parashara Horashastra and Jaimini Sutras, which are the ones I'm most familiar with, the nodes are heavily delineated. The nodes are given all kinds of significations in ways that you just don't see in um, any other astrological tradition that I'm aware of. In other words, like the nodes refer to like things, places, people, directions, uh, colors, objects and they they even rule large periods of time 
Whereas the only rulership of time that the nodes have in like the medieval tradition is the Ferdaria, and they, they each rule a measly like two, three years. But in Indian astrology, they rule, uh, they, they will, uh, Rahu, the North Node, will rule like an 18 year period of time. And Ketu, I think, rules like a, it's either six or eight years. I, 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 I never remember this because uh, computer software and stuff has kind of made me lazy. But the point is the Indians started really getting into them and using them in ways that no one was using them before. And so it's really the Indian texts, in my opinion, where we find the richest literature on the nodes and the most advanced conceptions of how to actually use them for profound interpretative results. Um, in the Hellenistic texts, they're mentioned briefly here and there. In many medieval and Arabic texts, they're again mentioned here and there, but they typically are not they're not um, they're not delineated in a profound way, and sometimes we find them left out almost entirely out of a text. You know, they're barely ever mentioned. Um, even in Yavana Jataka, which is the uh, the uh, sorry the way, the way I said it sounded ridiculous, but the Yavana Jataka, which is um, you know a, a really ancient Indian horoscopic text that has a lot in common with the Hellenistic tradition we find that the nodes are, to my knowledge, not mentioned at all in that text. It's quite, it's quite remarkable, actually. I didn't find them mentioned anywhere in that text, though admittedly I haven't combed the thing word by word, but I couldn't find them. So uh, obviously they weren't as important to other cultures as they were to the vast majority of the Indian astrologers who really started to you know, pick them apart and include them in, um, you know, like yoga judgment more, which is uh, basically configurations of planets. They, 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 really, they really started to talk about them more in depth and you started to get a clear idea of what they actually do and how they actually work. And so I'm, I'm hoping to talk about that a little bit here too and just sort of showcase some of the contrast. So to be clear, um, we're gonna start, I'm gonna share the screen actually. And so this is, uh, this is an article I've written upon the subject. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit here so you can see it better. At least I think I'm gonna zoom in. Okay, here we go. So uh, I've got quotes by Rhetorius, Valens, um, Parashara, and Jaimini. And I'm not going to be able to read them all. You can come to my website and read this um, blog post under the reflection section. Just click on this. Don't go here. Just click on this and you'll find this blog post. But anyway, the, this is basically uh, these opinions of these ancients are showcasing the thing they all have in common, at least it seems like, is that when either node is with the sun or moon, or if the sun or moon are square the nodes, it's very, very malefic. As Rhetorius says here, um, let's see. With the sun, indeed, the ascending node or descending node injures the father, but with the moon, it causes the death of the mother or declares her ignoble, and especially in the angles, uh, meaning, you know, uh, one, seven, I guess, 10 or four. Um, and I have found that to be true. The, 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 uh, the, the nodes with the luminaries can really wreak havoc on the person's parents and thereby logically it causes a lot of psychological trauma to the person as well. Um, now, to be fair, uh, spiritually speaking, it's kind of another story because the nodes, the, you know, spiritually, these kinds of traumas can open gateways into, you know, the loftier realms of existence because oftentimes suffering allows us to um, sort of motivates us to seek uh, something more profound in life and so on. So, you know, I'm just talking about the very basic level. Rhetorius also tells us that the... Um, the ascending node is generally helpful when, with, when it's with the benefics because it increases their power to bring beneficence and that it's um, 
problematic with the malefics because it increases their power to, to be malefic. And then the reverse for the south mode, it reduces the malefic nature of malefics, and it reduces, but it reduces the benefic nature of the benefics. There is, of course, some truth in this, but it's, it's rather oversimplified. And to really understand what happens when the nodes are with a specific planet, um, you need to, we need to understand a little bit more about them um, uh, on, a, on a deeper level. And it's, so, sorry, it's not even complex. It's, uh, it's astronomical, which I'll get to in a moment. Um, and I and also uh, draw your attention real quick to this image. This is the Tibetan Buddhist uh, conceptualization of the nodes. This being is called Rahula, similar to Rahu, right? Rahu and Ketu in India. So it's clearly a ferocious fire demon creature that uh, is said to dis basically purify and destroy things that are illusory. And so Rahula could be invoked, according to the Tibetans, to help a person deal with the harmful afflictions of karma symbolized by the other planets. So Rahula and the nodes are actually a profoundly spiritual component in astrology, ancient and modern, but it's often, but they're oftentimes misunderstood. This creature who is a representation of cosmic fire and purification is not going to necessarily be stabilizing or helpful for many, many people and many types of circumstances. Um, it requires certain unique situations for the, that type of thing to be the case. And that is sort of the realm of yoga and um, spiritual pursuits and stuff like that. So um, I might talk about that later or in another video, but, um, but then we have Valens and I, I quoted quite a lot from him and he's saying similar things to Rhetorius, although he, seems to emphasize like the utter and complete malefic nature of the nodes. He pretty much is saying here when the moon is with either of the nodes or square them, it's pretty much don't do anything. <laughs> don't elect for anything. Don't begin anything. Don't, um, you know, just wait for that to pass. It's, it's really not going to be worth it. Um, you can see here, beware of starting anything. Don't sail, don't marry, don't have meetings, don't begin anything, don't plant and so on and so forth. Here he says, if the degree of the ascendant is in connection with the node, the native will be short-lived. Um, I think it's important that he says the very degree, which is something we'll see with the nodes as well in a moment. Um, let's see. You know, here he talks about doom and violent death with when the luminaries um, are closely close to the nodes and so on. Again, both nodes, not one or the other. Parashara um, says a lot of things about the nodes, but I just wanted to quote this basic thing here. He says, Rahu and Ketu, the north and south node, are malefics. They're categorically malefics. And we see this across the board in Indian astrology. In Jaimini Sutras, which is a very kind of mystical, strange astrological text, we find these kinds of things associated, right? Rahu creates archers and thieves, snake charmers, and makers of metal mechanical instruments. So Clearly, there's this theme of kind of innovation and being sort of out, very outside the box, but also not necessarily the most um, nice, cuddly of persons. Certainly not a, this is certainly not a warm, fuzzy person like some of the uh, later medieval texts of the Arabs and Christians in Europe seem to imply. Saturn and Rahu together. Uh, consuming and imparting betel leaves, which is basically like uh, it would be the equivalent of taking some sort of drug today, like probably like heroin or cocaine or something like that. Sun and Rahu, snake death. Not exactly nice. Not exactly a, a nice thing. Ketu, an elephant dealer or thief. Okay, um, you know, an elephant dealer, not necessarily good, not bad, but somebody who, you know, is going to, is trying to make a, a buck, you know, perhaps a thief, uh, you know, it couldn't be more obvious anyway. Um, so, you know, basically what these, what these authors seem to be implying is that the nodes have a really destabilizing effect on uh, whatever they're touching, regardless of whether it's benefic or malefic. And they particularly have a, a very, very malefic or destabilizing effect on the, the luminaries. And again, this is, we can say that this is because of the mythos around 
the nodes. You know, it's a it's a dragon that's been cut in half for some. It's a demonic entity that tried to steal the nectar of immortality from the celestials in India or in Tibet. It's a similar kind of story. Uh, I think there's some slight differences, but nonetheless, it is some kind of ferocious fire demon with like 11 or so heads and a ton of eyes all over its body and, um, you know, fire everywhere and a bow and arrow that's actually made out of serpents, although it's not depicted like that here really. But, um, that's part of it too. It's, it's bow is made out of serpents. So, you know, and serpents of course are always associated with wisdom, but they're also associated with being venomous and dangerous. So you kind of have this double edged sword here with that. The, the easiest way to understand the nature of the nodes and why they're regarded as malefic is for the simple reason that when the sun and moon are either together and near one of the nodes or opposing each other and near the nodes an eclipse occurs. And that's really it. That's that's really where the nodes get their signification from, is this nature of eclipsing, making things dark, right? Making things, uh, but also it's a unique phenomenon. You know, it, 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 it inverts the natural order of things. During the big Leo eclipse that happened um, in September, I think, or, or no, not September, but uh, like August or so, I think of 2017, that big... Um, I think it was a full moon eclipse, if I remember. I remember my friend telling me that her chickens went, while this was happening, they just, and you couldn't even see it visibly because the clouds were obscuring it where I was, but her chickens huddled around in a circle. This is in the middle of the day. And then they all proceeded to go in, in a line back into their chicken coop and go to sleep. So when an eclipse happens, animals respond in in, in, in a way that is kind of like an inversion of nature because the chickens thought that it was nighttime when it clearly wasn't, right? So the animals are responding instinctively and energetically to these energies of eclipses. And so all of this stuff gives us something to interpret the nature of the nodes with. They eclipse things, right? They darken things. Rahu means, um, has this notion of darkening attached to it. Um, I'm not sure if the the word means that or not. I, I can't remember the the exact meaning of the word, but and K two strangely enough, the tail has uh, is you know the the word can mean like a comet or it it has uh, it also has the association with light is like one of kind of the meanings of it. Um, but you know Rahu has been called like the the darkener and associated with darkness and and K two has been associated with fogginess and cloudiness and stuff. Um, especially for the Indians, but also with light kind of paradoxically and comets, right? So, but in any case, they are, by, by their nature as, a, as causing eclipses, astronomically, right? They darken things and they sort of radically alter things so that they're not necessarily following the regular natural path of things, just like those chickens I just mentioned. So this gives us some profound clues to the nodes. You know, one, they are destabilizing, they are darkening, they're not good for basic things in the world um, of, of a, on a more ego-driven level, meaning on a more like, I just want things to be comfortable and secure and normal. They're not going to do that. And then because they in, invert the natural order of things, um, right, where the, uh, you know, and and actually, this is also in, in just the nature of the eclipses. I just realized this, right? When you have a, a solar eclipse, when the lights are conjunct, right? The sun is getting eclipsed. Normally, when the lights are conjunct, the moon is dark, not the sun, right? So it's an inversion. And then at the full moon eclipse, which is a, a lunar eclipse, the moon is blocked out, whereas the moon is normally fully illuminated. So again, inverting things, changing things, um, kind of turning things on their head which has a lot of metaphors we can mine it for. But ultimately the nodes also become extremely innovative and extremely important for any kinds of like major progress in terms of the development of just things in life and so on. But they upset this, they, they radically upset the status quo. So they're not in electional astrology, right? In natal charts and so on, any kind of astrology, especially when they're, they're with the lights, because the lights are so um, 
so much the foundation of everything else and all the light of the other planets comes from the sun and is reflected back, uh, not just the moon. When the nodes are with the luminaries, basically they are destabilizing, they are darkening, they are obscuring, even if it's not in uh, an eclipse because it's just, it's just the metaphor that um, all of astrology is built on these astronomical metaphors and so on. So, in a, but in electional astrology, which is mainly what this article I wrote is about, I was making the argument that, you know, you really don't want the moon uh, for most elections and for most talismanic creation to be with uh, the north node or the south node. And if you can avoid the sun too, uh, being with those nodes is the same way, again, or square them as well, you know, 90 degrees, uh, the moon there, because it, it's sort of like a, <clears throat> a powerful um, nexus of relationship or energies or whatever. But you really don't want that to be the case for the simple reason that, um, that the nodes are very destabilizing and the moon governs the, you know, it, it governs the tides of, of growth and decay and it governs our, our basic consciousness, our mind on, on a very basic sort of instinctual level and our ability to just adapt to every, uh, the changing circumstances of everyday life. So if it's conjunct either node, um, it can become, you know, grievously imbalanced. And so it's very destabilizing for the mind and it's very destabilizing for anything that you're creating on the planet, like in a material earthly sense, right? Because the moon, the moon brings the, the solar light, so to speak, down to our sphere. It's the closest thing to us relative to the other celestial bodies. And so it, it governs this dimension of materialism and change and growth and decay. So if it's screwy and, and whatnot, then the thing you created the talisman to do is not necessarily going to be all that stable. There, there's probably going to be a monkey's paw kind of effect wherein you get what you want, but there's a catch, you know, there's some kind of strange, um, strange deal that comes with that or, uh, or uh, instability or, or you're, kind of sacrificing something about it. It's, uh, it's hard for me to find the words to explain what I mean at the moment, but, um, but that's, where, that's the basic idea. And so, you know, later, later authors and later texts started to say that the nodes were good, or sorry, that the North Node was good and that it was just all well and good for everything and that it's fine and that it's just the South Node you have to worry about. But this really isn't very philosophical as far as I can see it. And I don't know what basis in astronomy it has personally when you look at what the nodes are really there to measure um, as far as astro astronomical phenomenon. Um, it's also not true that all astrologers seem thought that, uh, you know, later on after the Hellenistic period, that all Arabic and Persian astrologers thought that the no one node was good and one was bad. Here we have um, Mashallah, for example, who's 8th century saying, moreover, the terror or violent threat of the head and tail is whenever the sun and moon or any star is being separated from the head or tail by 12 degrees. They call this the threats of an eclipse. The degrees having been passed, it means freedom from fear. So he's saying that any, any planet or, and the sun and the moon within 12 degrees of either of the nodes is very distressing, is very, um, you know, terror, violent threat, and so on. He's implying that, and this is in alignment with what most of the Hellenistic astrologers say, and in many respects what the Indian astrologers will say, broadly speaking. So it's really a misconception that, you know, it just, oh, well, the Persian and Arabic astrologers shifted and they just thought this because blah, blah, blah. No, and we also find uh, Al-Biruni saying a similar thing, which I'm going to bring up right here. He says, some people say that the dragon's head is male and diurnal and the tail female and nocturnal, but this is quite illogical. So he's criticizing that idea that one's good and one's bad. Um, next, he says that, Basically here, um, let's see, uh, in regard to the foregoing, there is considerable difference between the sun and the moon on the one hand and on the other plan and the other planets on the other. 
when both of the luminaries are in aspect to each other and to the benefics, and are in their own sections of the signs or those of the benefics, both of them are strong. Okay, yeah, pretty simple, you know, just benefic aspects. But if they are in situations unsuitable to them, and the malefics full of enmity are above them, and the benefics below, or are eclipse, or near the dragon's head or tail. So he's talking about the benefics being afflicted by the head or the tail. He's not talking about the luminaries at the moment especially the latter by less than 12 degrees, right? Again, that same thing the Masha'Allah just said, both of them are weak. And then the moon is especially so when near or in conjunction or on the wane or under the earth or in the via combusta, all of which create weakness and so on. Um, so there it's hard to tell what he's saying uh, because it doesn't sound like he's saying... Um, it doesn't sound like it, that he's exactly saying that the moon is weak when with the nodes, but uh, that may be something he's implying. I'm not 100% sure. But again, it would be a really logical thing. And Al-Biruni was pretty logical and whatnot. Later in the text, he offers up, again, the idea of the, the nodes as one being, you know, beneficent, the other being malefic, north versus south. Um, but he doesn't really comment on it. And then he sort of criticizes the Babylonian, what he calls the Babylonian notion, which is what Rhetorius said, that the head increases when with benefics or malefics, but, de but the tail decreases with either of those two. And he criticizes that as being uh, generally illogical or unphilosophical. But then he does give the opinion of the Indians although he claims that they don't talk about the South Node, which is interesting. I don't know what his sources are, but he does give the opinion of the Indians and say they regard uh, the North Node as malefic. So he does give that in there. And, um, you know, we don't fully know what Al-Biruni's opinions are. They're, they're in a lot of situations in this text. They are um, kind of more subtle, it seems like. And, uh, you know, this is his, um, this is his introduction to the... Um, Book of Instruction to the Elements of the Art of Astrology. So in case you're wondering what book that is. And the Masha'Allah book I quoted from was um, um, Ben Dykes' translation, uh, Persian Dativities, Volume 1. Masha'Allah, the Book of Aristotle. For those of you who want to check that out. So, um, so yeah, this is kind of a, a first video in an endeavor to talk a little bit more about the nodes. And I think in the next video, I will talk more about them with regard to the Picatrix and a little bit more with regard to talisman creations and magic and my thoughts upon that area in relationship to the nodes. So I hope you enjoyed this video and please hit like, hit subscribe, share this thing far and wide and check out my website for individual consultations and more. Thanks. Have a great day.